So perhaps we should start because I think we have enough time to get through what I hope we will get through. So this is the final session of this memorial, uh, which is special remembrance, remembrances by colleagues, friends, and collaborators. I have secured a number of collaborators who will say a few words between five and 10 minutes, uh, each or less. Um, and then I think there will be time, and anybody who wants to come up and say something, you are absolutely welcome. I haven't had many non-mathematicians speaking, or we haven't had any at this, and it would be very nice if any, any friend or person like that would come and say some words remembering Jean. So I think the way we'll proceed is I'll introduce each person who will come up, say a few words. They have a blackboard to use if it's necessary. Uh, and interspersed, I might read some. I got an, quite a number of emails of people who wanted me to read something. So let's start with the longtime collaborator of Jean Alex Gumbert. He'll be the first. Thank you very much. Uh, not used to. So I should. Thank you very much. Um, the first encounter between uh, Anthony and Cleopatra in uh, the tragedy of Shakespeare, many consider his greatest, starts with Cleopatra saying, if this be love indeed, tell me how much. And uh, Anthony replies, there is beggary in love that can be reckoned. So with this in mind, I will keep my remarks non-mathematical. No, I wrote an essay for a general mathematical audience, and I will just say a word about this essay by reading from the acknowledgment. The acknowledgement dates the completion. Uh, this, the work on this essay uh, commenced in, I should look on the watch, I have five minutes. The work on this essay commenced in late December 2016, prompted by Frank Morgan's solicitation of an honorary Bourguin contribution for the notices. It was completed two years later, on the 20th of December 2018, while the author had the honor and privilege of enjoying the hospitality of the Hausdorff Institute in Bonn, 200 kilometers and two days separated from the place and time of Burgain's death in Bonnheiden, Belgium, on 22nd of December 2018. I'll read the first sentence, and you'll see why it is in the, in the tense that it is, and the essay is called Singular Adventures of Baron Bourguin in the Labyrinth of the Continuum. I'm not promoting the essay. There is an, ex the, the experts of this, which are on the Institute website, and then there's a link to a complete essay. I will make a few remarks about uh, the, so when you ask to write an, an honor, uh, yes, 500 publications, and I decided that it's best to follow his choice. And for the conference uh, that we had, he chose two equations, the second of which is the subject of the essay. It's the So if he chose this as one of his main results, I decided to concentrate on that. And so the essay consists of three main parts. The first one is about origins, which are reflected in the Kakea problem rendering. The main one is called 
some product phenomena and the labyrinths of the continuum, and then uh, discrete and continuous variations on the expanding theme. And this is alluded to in the rendering of a buckable, which is a calligraph of SL2 F5. Let me uh, just read the personal comments which were inserted uh, Uh, so I, I met John in September 2005, six months after my daughter who drew the pictures, who was six months after my daughter who drew the pictures for the as I was born, while visiting IS for the program League Groups, Representations, and Discrete Mathematics led by Alex Libotsky. I do not remember the precise date. <laughs> But do remember the hour. It was between 2 and 3 a.m. After changing my daughter's diapers, I could not sleep, went to Simone Hall, and ran into Jean walking to the library. It was in this discombobulated state that I was free of spear to speak to him. By dawn, the problem which had been resisting my protracted attack for a decade was vanquished in John's office. Uh, people talked yesterday a lot about uh, John being a formidable, uh, I think even Enrica said that he was intimidated by Jean. Now I must tell you that there was one person who intimidated Jean, and that was Mary Jane. Uh, because at the beginning of this collaboration, this was a problem I thought about for 10 years, and it was quite intense, so I, I mean, I, I had something to contribute, so we worked intensely a lot, and I so I saw how after lunch he would follow a route avoiding Mary Jane, and Mary Jane would confront him and say, "Jean, I need to talk to you." And uh, I also recall being in his office and him receiving a call from Mary Jane, and it, I don't know what she was saying, but. It was five to seven minutes at the end of the call. He said, uh, it meets my approval. Now, let me say about, OK, so now Jean had the following daily routine. He would arrive at the dining hall for lunch within five minutes of its closing. And while descending the stairs, he would look for whom to join for the meal. The relevance of the person was determined primarily by their expertise in the problem Jean was currently working on. After lunch and before the sunset, the door of his office would be half open. After getting a bottle of red wine, typically Midoc, Jean would have dinner around 9 p.m., followed by a double espresso, typically in small world coffee, return to the office, call his wife and son, and then go for a brisk walk, encircling the Einstein Drive about five times. Between midnight and sunrise, the office door would typically be closed. His handwritten notes, like that of Mozart's and unlike Beethoven's, are virtually free of corrections, in part because during the dinner and the walk, he would think about what would be said to paper when he's upon his return to the office. Now, I'll just read the first sentence. I'm finishing. I'll just read the first sentence. Uh, actually, before reading the first sentence, there is one other drive, uh, which is, th there are two drives. There is Einstein Drive and there is Von Neumann Drive, where I'm staying. And the similarities between Von Neumann and Burgain are striking. Um, let me uh, just, people commented on the style of his writing and a very similar thing was expressed by Birkhoff about von Neumann. I think I might not have it, so I don't say it. But there is a statement by Goldstein about von Neumann who said that the rumor had it in Princeton that while well, he was indeed a demigod, 
He made a detailed study of humans and could imitate them perfectly. Now, about exposition, I think this remark about Johnny is equally applicable to Jean. It is difficult to sharpen Van Neumann's results. With small concern for expository simplifications or intuitive motivations, he characteristically went straight to the heart of problems and had an uncanny ability to check all the essentially different possibilities individually and in combination. This ability gives most of his work an objective finality and makes later workers begin by trying to simplify the Neumann's arguments or to apply similar techniques to related problems. Finally, in his article, the legend of John van Neumann, Paul Halmers uh, has the following to say, the heroes of humanity are of two kinds. The ones who are just like all of us, but very much more so. And the ones who apparently have an extra human spark. We can all run, and some of us can run the mile in less than four minutes. But there is nothing most of us can do that compares with the creation of the great G mine of you. The Neumann's greatness was the human kind. We can all think clearly, more or less, some of the time, but the Neumann's clarity of thought was orders of magnitude greater than that, than that of most of us all the time. Both Norbert Wiener and John von Neumann were great men, and their names will live after them, but for different reasons. Wiener saw things deeply, but intuitively, von Neumann saw things clearly and logically. Now, you might agree or disagree, but it is my belief that Bourguet's greatness combined these two kinds. And now I'm finishing. I read the first sentence of my essay. Baron Bourguet, the IBM Van Neumann professor in the School of Mathematics at the Institute for Advanced Study, IES, is one of the most original, penetrating, and versatile analytical minds of our troubled times, justly celebrated and revered without reservation. When I wrote this essay, I sent it to people who were mentioned to it. I also sent it to uh, Dan Struck, who, was, who taught me analysis as an undergraduate at MIT. And, and uh, he said he liked the essay. But as a Jew, I always respond badly to the idea that one might revere a man. And then my daughter had baptisma. My Hebrew is not what it is. But I looked at the fifth commandment. And many interpret it as commanding you to revere your mother and father. Now, my mathematical father is Peter uh, Sarnak. Probably Jean is mathematical. In any case, mother, I don't know. I, thought I, l I kept revere. And let me end. I started with Shakespeare. Let me end. I was another quote from Shakespeare, and this is Hamlet speaking about his father. He was a man, take him for all in all, I shall not look upon his likes again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alex. Um, Perhaps we can uh, skip the clapping and do it just at the end. It seems uh, this is friendly audience. So Ingrid Dobichies will be next, thank you, who's well known to everybody and was a faculty member here at Princeton amongst many of her many achievements. And is from Belgium. <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm among a small minority here of people who never wrote a paper with Jean, uh, but I think of all the people here, I have known Jean the longest. Uh, uh, Jean and I were uh, undergraduates at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel in the same cohort, 
I mean, it's a very small, it was then even smaller university. And uh, he, in, like in many European universities, you had to de certainly then declare your major from day one, well, before day one. And uh, uh, he uh, majored in mathematics. I, to the great chagrin of my mother, uh, uh, chose to major in physics. Not that she would have preferred mathematics, I would have been just as bad. She would have wanted me to be an engineer. She said, uh, physics, she says, it's, it's like it's almost as bad as an artist, she says. You'll, you'll, you, you won't ever make a living. Uh, you'll have to live in the gutter. Um, so, but I did physics. And physics and math students uh, had, uh, in physics, we had a lot of math courses. And in our first two years, we had almost all the same courses as the math majors, actually. In our first year, we just had one course that was not the same. In our second year, we had three courses that were not the same. And that is, a, is little because we had many, many courses. Um, so I couldn't take those courses because I uh, uh, had other classes at the same time. And I did uh, pass the exams in the second uh, in the second session. We had we could take exams in in, in June or in in August, and uh, I uh, and I studied in those with the notes from Jean's courses. It was a very small university, and uh, the courses were in Dutch uh, because uh, that's where we that was our our school language. It was not Jean's, Jean's mother tongue. His mother tongue was French, but uh, at, he went to school in Dutch and in the Flemish part of the country, and so did I. And uh, so uh, it was a new university, so there were no written course notes yet that, uh, that started only then. Uh, so you had to take good notes in class, or you had nothing to study from. So people who took good notes were very sought after, and uh, you then f accompanied your notes to the photocopy machine. You didn't leave them out of your sight, because if you lost them, you had no notes. So, But Jean uh, trusted me and lent me his notes. Now, of course, after he had passed his exam, so it was a little less critical. But uh, um, So we, uh, we actually hung out a lot with each other the first year, uh, because I was, I was absolutely, uh, I mean, I had never met a boy who was at least as good in math as I was. I mean, of course, we now know he's a, a much deeper and better mathematician, but uh, 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 so I was, I had developed a meat crush. I mean, I, I didn't know that species existed. So, uh, uh, so uh, and so we hung out a lot and uh, we talked math a lot and that was, that was fun. Uh, he had promised that he would uh, teach me to tennis over the summer if I came near 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 uh, uh, their house. And once I was in the neighborhood, I mean, because in Belgium, I mean, although distances are not very small by American standards, uh, people don't travel as far as by American standard. And, uh, and he was not home, his grandfather was home, and his grandfather laughed so much at a girl calling up Jean that uh, uh, I thought, oh my God, I'm the laughing stock of this family, and I gave up. And uh, 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 in the second year, I, I befriended a student in, in, in uh, physics who became my boyfriend. That it only lasted for eight years, but uh, uh, so it didn't survive. Uh, but uh, but I, 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 I had a little bit of satisfaction about the fact that maybe Jean had thought of me otherwise than just a mathematical uh, uh, interlocutor when after an exam where we both came out very early, uh, he uh, he and I were waiting, and then when my boyfriend came out, he says, now I wonder how he did. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, we, we, uh, we used to race each other because we had problem sessions together. We wouldn't get just homework problems that we would have to do on our own and then bring in. We had sessions in class together where we would work through problems. And so we used to race each other and uh, to, to the, the great chagrin of all our co-students, because they said as a result of our being there, uh, the level of that year became much higher than it usually was. And there were a couple of students who were doing the year over again after having failed exams the year before, and none of them made it. They said it was so much harder now a year. But, um, well, Jean was fun. Jean was, uh, uh, and he was, always very focused on math and learning lots more and, and explaining and, and uh, math to us. And 
I, in the light, later years, I decided to remain in physics, even though I had considered switching to math because of a fantastic course I had in my second year in which we saw that uh, optics, Fourier, uh, actually, the, when you send light through a lens, it actually performs a Fourier transform. And I thought that was so glorious. And I was doing, in, in the lab, optical Fourier transforms. And so that's later, I, I mean, I'm now in math. I have no degree in math. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just a pretend mathematician. But uh, uh, I, I never regretted that I learned all that physics. We, after we graduated, we all went, uh, went out. And in fact, I only realized recently that I have no pictures of John during this period because we didn't wa walk around with phones that were cameras in our pockets. And so we took much fewer pictures and he didn't come to the parties typically. So uh, the picture you saw this morning was a picture I got from somebody else in our cohort who happened to be in high school also with Jean. And so he sent me a picture of their, the spring picture that was taken of their senior class in high school. So, so that was only a few months before I met Jean for the first time. So, uh, and he was kind of dashing too, as well as very smart. So, uh, in any case, so at the graduation, uh, we were all hanging out, the physics and math students together, and we went and drank some some of the the, the, the very good and strong Belgian beers for, for which Belgium is known in a, a cafe on the Grand Place in Brussels, and Jean for once was there at a party and drank quite a bit more than we'd ever seen him drink, and so he was a bit tipsy. And at at the uh, uh, Somebody at some point proposed a mathematical puzzle. And uh, the mathematical, I mean, simple, not really a puzzle. I mean, but it was still a little riddle. He says, imagine you have three people who go to a cafe and they uh, buy their beers and so on. And then the, uh, uh, they, they only have to, a piece of 10 francs to pay with. This was still the time of francs. And uh, so the bill comes and it's, it's 27. And so it's, it's, no, it's 25, sorry, 25. And they give their pieces of 10, and the waiter comes back with a, a solver with five uh, pieces of one franc. And they say, well, let's each take one franc, and the two that remain are for the waiter. And the riddle is then the following. So uh, they paid 27, and there's two for the waiter, but that only adds up to 29. Where's the last franc going? And John puzzled and puzzled, and we were all sitting there, come on. <laughs> and so whenever actually people from our cohort still meet, they say, do you remember this time that there was this stupid riddle and Jean didn't see? And then when he saw it, of course he saw it, he said, oh my, that's so stupid. <laughs> so it is, uh, but so we remember that time with great affection. I have. I, I met Jean, of course, since I ended up in mathematics. I met Jean over the years, and in fact, there, there was, uh, he wrote a paper on one question I asked him, and, and uh, I'm sorry that we never uh, uh, did end up working together, but uh, uh, there, was, there was that affectionate spark, and, uh, which, was, uh, which was fun to, to, to have. He's not the first of our cohort to, to leave. Uh, the first one we lost when she was 34. But uh, um, I mean, we all remember him very much. And he is, of course, a great man, as you've all said. And yes, it's sad that he's gone. But he has contributed so much. So let's not just be sad. Let's just have joy at all the things he brought. Thank you. Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, let me read from Wilhelm, Wil, Wilhelm Schlag. I consider it one of the greatest privileges of my mathematical life to have had the opportunity to work with Jean on problems related to Anderson localization of disordered systems. This started in 1999 and continued for about a year. Jean wrote a highly influential paper with Michael Goldstein on non-perturbative localization for one-dimensional quasi-periodic operators with positively upper exponents in 2000. Shortly after, Michael and I wrote a paper on holder continuity of the integrated density of states. The three of us then collaborated on localization for Schrodinger co-cycles with larger disorder 
for the base dynamics given by a skew shift on a two torus. Jean was extremely interested in the skew shift dynamics at the time and remained so ever since. The key problem of positively open enough exponents for any disorder for the skew shift remains open. The skew shift dynamics involves the distribution of the fractional parts of n squared times omega rather than n times omega n, as in the case of the standard shift. I will remain forever grateful to have experienced Jean's radiant, radiant brilliance, his integrity, fairness, and generosity. Let me put in another one quickly. Luigi Ambrosio, I have been deeply saddened by the departure of Jean Bergen. I had the possibility to write a paper jointly with H. Brazis and A. Figali with him, but we never met. On the other hand, I had so many occasions to appreciate the, de the breadth and the depth of his work. Most recently, when with a few, few colleagues, I prepared his nomination for the prestigious Feltrinelli Prize of the Academia, Academia di Lancia in Italy. The nomination was successful and he was awarded the prize in 2016. His work shows how rich and marvelous is our discipline and his mathematical legacy will last forever. So let me continue now with Steinslow Sarek. Stanislaw? Shrek? Sarek. Who I believe is at least a collaborator and much more of John. Okay, so this was said already in different words uh, a number of times that whenever someone who touched our lives passes away, well, on one hand, our world gets, world gets diminished, but on the other hand, there is a positive effect uh, in that uh, their influence lives in us and by extension in those who come after us essentially forever. And it is clear from all the testimonials that we have heard yesterday, today, that in this sense, Jean will remain, remain alive for the foreseeable future. And while I am talking here, of course, about mathematical community, but the same principle applies to, to every sphere of the human condition. So uh, Jean and I were almost the same age, and we met uh, a few times in uh, Banach Space Circle, which is where we both grew up. Uh, circles and, uh, in like late 70s, but uh, we got to know each other a little bit better in late 80s when I spent uh, uh, two and a half years in uh, in at IHES. And so he, John was my host and his office was next to mine. And so we would talk uh, at least a little most of the days when he was, uh, he, when he didn't travel, and I didn't travel very much, because at the time my only travel document was a US reentry permit, and uh, going anywhere outside of France required a, obtaining an advance approval from the prefecture, which required a letter from the director of HES and took quite a while. But anyway, that's a, the, that's a site. So, <clears throat> so we, when we talked about mathematics, then we of, he, of course, had much more to, to report on than I did. But we ultimately uh, ended up collaborating on two papers. And both of those papers, I'm not going to go into technical details, but uh, both of them were substantial uh, advances on questions that have been open for arguably decades and sort of stuck, but occasionally would also speak about other things. So, um, so at the time he was a, a bachelor and I was uh, married with three children. And a couple of years earlier, Vitaly Milman uh, visited the IHES for a year, er, and Jean was extremely impressed 
may, maybe also by Vitali, but primarily by Vitali's wife, Luda. <laughs> and uh, so, so, well, it's just when we, when we discussed life, he somehow mused about possibly getting a Russian wife. <laughs> so, well, of course, it would have been presumptuous for me to, to advise anyone on the vagaries of the, the human relationships. Well, so for, for, for starters, that, that marriage I was in at the time ended a few years later in a divorce, so, well. But there was some mathematically based advice that I could, could have given him. And so Jean didn't really teach a lot in, on the undergraduate level in his career, but I had to teach uh, introductory statistics at some time. So I could lecture him on the fallacy of um, working with a sample of size one. And the punchline was, what can we infer about the population variance? <laughs> OK, well, that's, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stanislaw. Uh, all right, I think this is an appropriate time for asking Vitali Milman to respond. We all know Vitali, and and maybe maybe your wife as well, <laughs> if you would like to say something before or after Vitali. You want to say something? Yeah. No. Okay. So, ten minutes, Vitali. You said me 15. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see much well from here. Okay, so uh, first would be still a little bit sad start, but I don't assume to be sad oppositely, actually, I think it is uh, more important. So we receive message that Jean is sick from him just a week or two weeks after diagnostic. And the uh, uh, diagnosis was so terrible that all doctors are now around us, and I have in family doctors, said not more than a year. Be, uh, you should know this, to be ready. And actually, it's written as the Google was, so Jean knew the same. So we immediately went to him. I had actually a photo, but impossible to show, uh, of Jean three months after it started. Uh, what is interesting now? We enter his house, he waited us, of course. Uh, just very soon after this, he said the following. Does to be said, said help? Absolutely not. So we should not be said anymore. And took bottle of wine, which he could not drink. But I did not know this, that him forbid, because he opened, even then I learned that it was only for us. Okay. And we were not said. Photo shows this very nicely. Now, uh, of course, miracle happened. Miracle that it was extended over uh, sure time for three and a half years. But miracle has name, and name is his sister, uh, uh, Claire Burgain. She is doctor. Uh, I should say you something which is such, in all days, very starting, 80s, middle 80s, before, parents of Jean told us that we all excited with Jean, but he has young sister and she is real top. It was word. She proved that she is a top when now we know what's happened with Bourguet. It is a proof, it is, was impossible. No one single doctor I know believe in this. So, enough, enough. It is extremely live, a live personality was, very funny, and I want to be only funny now, because I think we should not remember last days, but all, all life. Just I want to say that in his last message to me, I just read sentence from this. As usual, some problems, but I work Mass is the, what I like the most. And how he love <laughs> mass, there are different stories. I will say no one. How a person who love mass succeeded to work under any conditions. So 
I arrived once to Bure when Eric, his son, was around seven, eight years old. He knew I need some word to check, crawl, yeah, crawl, but not walk. So he had his son, and if he wanted to talk with me and even to write something. So method was the following. Now someone may write down and be a millionaire from this. It is method, okay? I just not businessman to use this. But put name of Burgain inside when you will use. So in one of the middle, uh, middle sides room for meeting perhaps was huge table, oval table, white and absolutely smooth surface, yes? He put Eric in the middle. We sit down on big X of this oval and work. Eric happily look on father and try to crawl, but stay on the place because it's absolutely smooth. Father happily look on the sun and work with me. 30 minutes, Eric lovely tried to come to father. We work without any distortion. And <laughs> then with no hard meaning, father took child and we walk out. So this method I try to sell to my son, but somehow he did not use this, I don't know why. Okay, but, uh, but I want to, to say uh, uh, some stories actually about uh, what it was under discussion, his love, not love, uh, to, to give a talk. So there exists different type of talk. Talk, scientific talk, uh, he like, like to do very much. But uh, to give classes, he hated, hated. And so I give these two examples of one and another. So about scientific talk. So just example of concrete situation which explain to you what is going on. Once we should go to conference, which was, uh, once, it is two months from moment of our discussion, I even don't think about this, and he suddenly said to me, you know, Vitaly, I don't yet prove theorem, which I will uh, talk here. More of this, I even don't know in what direction I want to prove this theorem. So two months before talk, but every talk was co something completely new. Two months before, he still did not know what theorem he proved for this conference in this direction. So, but it is almost normal was for him to knew this. Opposite was when in 60 and 85, he received chair in Urbana Champagne. Uh, Duke chair, I see. I think it was some obligation, very little. University department wanted to give him this chair because it was needed to find big money under someone, and they give him very little obligation. But to start this, he had to give some course, and it was perhaps one month, two, two times per week by week, some course for graduate students and, and, and researchers on this faculty. But he was so depressed that asked me if I may to come to talk, discuss something. So I come to Urbana for a week. It was exactly the first week of this course. And this is, was Tuesday and Thursday. And so around noon, so perhaps 11.30 or 12, and we sit down in a cafe, drink coffee before his lecture, and he extensively writes something. I ask you to prepare your talk. No, he said, I compute how much I will be paid for this talk to improve mood that I could go to give it. Okay, I would do perhaps the same. But two days later, on Thursday, we again sit down there and again have the same coffee in the same place. And he again write intensively something. And what you compute now, I ask? He said, I compute how much I will receive this talk <laughs> that will improve my mood. But I say, but you did compute this two days ago. No, I should see this by my eyes to be able to go. <laughs> so this is fact, absolutely, which is difficult to imagine. But um, OK, but actually, he was, I, I was need to give him some lectures of how to to give lectures because uh, you know this 84 85 is spent together in Bursa Rivet uh, was first time he's as I said in my lecture in such top place and we had two seminars uh, Gromov asked me to lead his geometry seminar and besides this was functional analysis Pizier Burgen and I was there and he gave many talks and top people come to listen to him 
But you know, before he gave talk on the conferences of Banach Space people, and you know, he solved some problem, he gives this, and talk about this absolutely not understandable, and everyone even more impressed, because problem solved and they don't understand. So he looks to be very clever. And then I just, every time before talk, I discuss, and I explain him one thing. If Gromov or Kohn or Sullivan or some other people who sit down and listen, your talk is, you will be, they will be impressed only if they will understand. These people think that if they don't understand, you are an idiot, not them. They cannot decide things this about themselves. So your, your way to impress, to prepare talk in the way that they will understand. And this was time after time, and he succeeded. In the end, he gave reasonable talks, and they were impressed a lot, and everything was successful. However, later he returned to the, his old way to give talks, and thing which I was really impressed, it was here. Two years ago, when he gave talk of video, it was the best his talk I ever heard. And I don't know, auditoria perhaps did not know this. It was question to him, and he clever answered on every question. But it was one day after him, very heavy him. And second day, it is the worst day. And he gave talk, and you did not feel this. And he answered question, as he absolutely OK. This <laughs> was very difficult to me to see, because I, 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 I knew this. OK, so um, I have a couple of uh, two, a few things which I want to say, because uh, I don't know. I still have a few minutes, yes? There exists enormous amount of very lovely story connected with him. For example, you know, he woke up tonight. It was still many times. Because this time, nobody knocked on your door, nobody called you, and it is quiet. And this is the best time to work. But sometimes, you need different atmosphere. When you don't want to concentrate on one point, but you want oppositely to see full picture, to change point, and so on. And for this, Jean took train and went to Paris and back, which is 30, 40 minutes one direction. No, go out of train, go out to change plane back, uh, 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 travel back. It is white noise inside this train help him to think and to understand subject. And he did it many times. By the way, he never bought tickets to ways. Because he say, when I, <laughs> I never may find my tickets way back. So I anyway will buy second time. So I will better buy only one way. This he couldn't. This seemed to lead to some funny, all <laughs> the last uh, such discussably easy problem. When he also worked for the same reason by Champs-Élysées, trying to, uh, again, to relax and have this noise. But you know, professional, Sieved, immediately sees that this guy completely inside himself. Okay? And one story finished badly, but not too badly. It could be very badly. Because he walks this way, and by no reason he could understand, later he said me. He come to window of shop with Meryl. And he noted that his back pocket, when he kept money and all documents, it was summer, nothing more, was already this, this pocket, already like here. It was three times cut and last remaining. It was necessary to him to do one meter more. And he told us, so he took himself, entered the shop, and both you. Yes. But, but if it would be cut, he does not know what he would do. No money, no, no, no anything. So one should be seen, but not, not too, too, too intensively. Perhaps last uh, thing I will say, the story infinitely believe long life together. And so uh, this was in, in Berkeley, in MSRI. And uh, we fly from Banff, uh, from some conference, evening and next morning started another conference immediately. And I had first talk opening. So next morning I give talk, Jean of course sleep, he did not come to talk. 
In the middle of this talk, it was 88, it was very strong earthquake. The strongest after 26, later was more strong. But everything woke. No, in time of my talk, so Lyndon Strauss, Europe noted, Vitaly did not know that there is earthquake. Because indeed I saw that it's something else. But later, talk finished, and comes Jean. I'm sorry I, that I, you don't see me, so I, I may show him. But his treasure was <laughs> the color of, uh, brown color of more or less similar to coffee. I don't know, all, all around down. I said, what's happened? I did not have extra tre treasure. But you know, in the morning, I took this coffee, it happened earthquake. You see, Jean, I said, on my talk, better not to miss. I promise I will never miss your talk anymore. Thanks, Vitaly. Uh, so let's see where we're at. Um, Marius Mirek, who I think wrote a paper only very recently with Sean. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm an assistant professor at uh, Rutgers University, and so I met Jean Bourguin in 2016 when I came to the institute, and before that time I only read some of his papers. And in fact, the first papers which I, I read, it was his celebrated work from 1989 on pointwise ergodic theorems for arithmetic sets. And it's an, it's very important, it was very important paper in analysis. I, I remember that I spent five months to, to complete and digest all of the, uh, all of the details. Uh, but I have to say that it was the, the, the best investment of, of time I have ever done. And this paper was very influential and still is very important in, in, in my research. But before I came, before I become a member of the IAS, I had an ongoing project with Eli Stein and Boisier Vrubel on some dimension-free estimates for discrete hardy with maximal functions. And the question we considered was motivated by Jean's work on high dimensional maximal functions associated to convex bodies. So this paper uh, where the isotropic constant was introduced. And this paper was discussed yesterday by Professor Milman. And working with Eli Stein and, and Boisier Vrubel, we made some initial progress, which was very encour encouraging. And I emailed about that to, to, to Jean, but he had, ne he had never responded. So it was two months uh, before I came to the, to the institute. And I thought that Jean did not care too much about this kind of problems at that time. And uh, so I was wrong. So during the opening ceremony in the, in the School of Mathematics, Tom Spencer uh, told me, Marius, do you know that Jean came today and you should go and say hi to him? But I, I thought that maybe it, it was not a good idea since, um, so I was, I was uh, intimidated by the fact that he didn't reply to my email. But then I had some glass of wine and I decided to go. So, and I went to the, to the Simony Hall, knocked to his, to his door. He opened it and I said, hello, Professor Burgen. I'm Mario Schmirek. I came to, to say hello. And he said, great that you are coming. You sent me an email some time ago. And I said, yes, but I've never gotten any response from you. He said, oh, I knew that you were coming. I knew that uh, you were coming, so I didn't want to waste my time. Anyway, you, you ask about a very nice question, and let me say what I know about this problem. And he started to, 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 to write down on the blackboard what he knew. And this is, this is how we started working together. And then we, we discussed some problems on a more regular basis. And we met usually in the, in the evenings. And so, so I have to say that it was a great experience for me and great privilege to, that I had had a chance to, to work with, with Jean Bourguin and also with Eli Stein. And I know that Eli and Jean 
uh, for Eli Stein and Jean Bourguin, it was very important that after many years of their friendship, about 30 years, I think, that they had written some papers. And for me, it was also a great honor to be a part of this project. So, so last December was very sad for me when I learned that Jean and Eli passed away. And last time I have heard from Jean was Sunday, December 16, he emailed me. And I told him that I had some, some new thoughts about the problems we were discussing, we were thinking about, and he, he replied me saying, uh, short mes messages are okay with iPad. So this is, this, that was his, his reply. So I, uh, I think about Jean and Eli every day and I miss them very much. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marius. Uh, next, Zev Rudnik, a regular co-worker of Jean. Uh, dear friends, um, I'm here to share some brief memories of Jean. I collaborated with them over a stretch of about eight years and uh, I wanted to present two short vignettes from our interactions together. Um, and the first one, I will call, where is the beef? So my first significant interaction with him came when I was invited to give the colloquium at the Princeton Math Department around 2005. And they spoke about lattice points and I was very surprised to see Jean in the audience um, because he tended to ration the amount of talks that he attended quite correctly. And after the lecture, he came up to me and smiled and said, I was hoping for some more beef. <laughs> Meaning he wanted to see the gory details. And I explained that I wanted to keep the audience awake, which made him laugh. He didn't share this uh, approach, as many people have remarked here before me. And once after a particularly demanding lecture of his, observing the, the glazed looks of the audience, probably, he sheepishly told me that he clearly didn't have enough practice teaching calculus, or anything else for that matter. And most of you know, Jean's brilliance was recognized early on and didn't have to do any real teaching for most of his career. We heard about uh, one activity that he had to do in Urbana, but that wasn't uh, clearly enough to train him to give a proper lecture course. So the other story, which I think came up so we started to, to work together during a two-year sabbatical that I spent at the Institute between 2008 and 2010. So early on in my stay, I had a discussion with uh, Peter here and quickly discovered a small result which I liked about restriction theorems for eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the torus, which involved uh, this arithmetic function that uh, was mentioned here before yesterday. And uh, I told Peter about it, and then the following day, Jean showed up in my office saying he heard about it from Peter and wanted to see it, as he had thought of related matters. And then I, after talking to him for about one minute, I quickly realized that he, of course, had thought about it before, he, he knew this result, uh, but um, he was too polite to say so explicitly. So in any case, we started discussing various uh, variations on the idea, and that led to a very long collaboration on restriction theorems. So when working on a project, we quickly settled into a routine where we would take turns, Jean would come into his office after lunch, as we heard here, 
and then start chewing on the problem. And then around three in the morning, he would send me an, an email with a scan of his handwritten notes, which I think many people here have received such scans. And I would get the, those upon waking up, and after putting my kids on the school bus here at Var Lane, I would go into my office and uh, face the challenge of understanding what these notes said. The handwriting was very clear, that wasn't the issue. Um, and then sometimes, but quite rarely, making my own little progress, and then I would tell him about it or send by email before going to sleep. And I found this a very exhausting process because I was doing uh, more than I was uh, capable of to keep track of it and uh, even digest even a, a small, uh, hopefully positive proportion of his ideas. And then all too quickly, Jean would resolve the problem, cut and paste his notes, and I mean cut and paste physically with scissors and cello tape. <laughs> Make these into a manuscript, complete with hand-drawn figures, and declare victory. And these notes he would give to, his, to Ellie Gustafsson, his longtime assistant, to type. The first time I got this manuscript, I looked at it and turned pale. I didn't see myself in the mirror, but I, I, I could tell that I was turning pale. And uh, I was trying to be diplomatic, and I told John, this is a good first draft. I was trying to be really diplomatic here. And then uh, he laughs, looks at me, and says, what is a draft? <laughs> so the challenge uh, for me became to try to intercept the notes before they got to Italy. <laughs> And if I was too late to actually steal her tech files and, and uh, work on it until I was satisfied with the exposition. So among other things, I prefer to do things as an exposition top down rather than bottom up. And um, this process didn't interest John at all. Uh, and he was quite happy to let me waste my time polishing the notes while he turned his attention to other things. So that was our modus operandi. So let me conclude by saying that uh, Jean was a prince among men. As a mathematician, he combined sheer strength with an uncanny and really enviable ability to maintain concentration for long stretches of time. So he is sorely missed. Thank you. Thank you, Zev. Uh, yeah, Jean's scanning machine was his weapon. You know, people are blogging this or that. We all know about it. The, the scanning machine was in uh, in the in the office there, um, and he had a key to that office, and he would get in there and attack you with his scans, which were, I think, Zev described it extremely well. Um, let me read from uh, Machies, Machek, Zworski. I was fortunate to collaborate with Jean Bourguin on a small project joined with Nicholas Burke. It concerned a control theory problem on Tori and came about as follows. Bourguin gave fascinating churn lectures in Berkeley, and as some of them concerned convex co-compact quotients, I was hoping he could help me and my favorite with my favorite problems there, fractal in parentheses, fractal vial laws. Nothing worked and eventually Bergen said, it is too hard, but I would really like to solve a problem for you. Give me a problem on the torus. I can solve any problem on the torus. <laughs> because of previous work with Burke, I did have one and of course he did solve it. <laughs> uh, so next, Alberto Grunbaum, who I think also co-wrote a paper or two with Jean. We'll clarify that. Hello, I'm Alberto Grunbaum from Berkeley, too. And I wrote only one paper. I must be in the unique, the unique element here among people that have never read a single paper of Jan, except for the one that we wrote together. That was written with two uh, colleagues of mine, uh, Luis Velasquez and John Wilkening, 
one in Spain, one in Berkeley. I'm going to read the title of the paper, and then I have marked here seven things that I want to say. It will take maybe 30 seconds, each one of them, so I should be finished quickly. The, the title of the paper is Quantum Recurrence and Operator Valued Sure Functions. So I'll try at least to explain the meaning of the words. It's probably the only paper of Jan, correct me if I'm wrong, that has to do with quantum mechanics, but the Schrodinger equation is never mentioned. This is discrete time evolutions. This is about quantum walks. So I'm finished with point one. Why am I giving this uh, little talk here? First of all, we are looking for a collaborator. So even if you are one-tenth or one-hundredth like uh, Jan, please talk to us. <laughs> we, when we are talking about moving forward on this, we always say this is something that Jan would do in one second. So please go and look at the paper. It's in Communications of uh, Mathematical Physics 2014. So that's one reason I'm talking. The second one, and I will try to put something in the blackboard at the very end, I think we implicitly are suggesting an experiment that a, an experimental physicist should carry out. We find a very, very counterintuitive result, which mathematically is certainly correct, but it may or may not have to do with the real world. So if you're an experimental physicist, we can stop this right now and we'll go together and we'll, you, you, you will try to do the experiment. So in terms of the long-term influence of Jan, nothing would make me happier than to know that somebody has actually tried to check in the lab, I'm not talking of a Gedanken experiment, in the lab, maybe quantum optics, uh, the ideas that are in that paper. So I'm finished with point number two. So what's a quantum walk? Quantum walk, discrete time, unitary evolution. So take an ordinary classical walk and replace your stochastic matrix by a unitary one, just a fixed one. U to the n gives you the evolution. Finish with point number three. What's a sure function? Well, this goes back to Isaiah Sure. It's by definition an analytic function from the open unit disk to the closed unit disk. So that appears in the title. But we are doing in that paper operator valued ones. So you have to put norms instead of ordinary complex numbers. Before, we even, uh, before I even met Jan, we had proved something that I thought was still cute, which is that Schur functions in defined exactly in the way that Schur did that, 19, 15, 18, some, some 18, happen to be the generating functions for first return amplitudes for a quantum walk. Enrico Bombieri was talking yesterday about comparing Jan with Euler, and I think Euler may have been the one that invented generating functions, so I think that was, that was very good. The other thing that he was talking about was inequalities as opposed to equalities. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so I'm finished with point number five. I'm almost done, okay? In 2013, Eric was finishing undergraduate at Berkeley, and Jan and his wife came and spent a year in Berkeley. Uh, I didn't know that I was supposed to be intimidated by him. That I learned later on, okay? I had seen our results on these sure functions and so on, and I saw a paper by two of my friends, Louis Nirenberg and Heim Bresis, and then something that Jan had done after that, computing some index by means of some counting function. So I went to him and said, look, we have something that looks a little bit like something in your paper. So I'm finished with point six, and now let me get to seven. I will tell you what is the experiment, what is the result that we prove in that paper, it's all very non-technical. I was completely impressed by all the super uh, fancy things that he did, but our stuff can be understood very, very easily, I think. That's what everyone says. So imagine, can I write here? But maybe the... Uh, Maybe on the small board on the left, yeah. This 
So imagine that you have a quantum walk, okay? <coughs> and that is just an ordinary walk, eh? discrete time and discrete state space. So this is discrete time and discrete space quantum mechanics. Quantum walks, I didn't know this, had been introduced by Aharonov, the same one, the Aharonov bomb effect. But I don't want to go that far. So suppose you take an initial state. I should draw this as a vector, unit vector in some Hilbert space, but that is irrelevant. So let me call this is the initial state. And here is another state B. And here is a whole collection of other states. So this is the initial state. And we, can, we give sense in the paper to the following quantity. And this is where the difficulty is in the paper. How do you respect quantum mechanics to make sense of the following? The probability of eventually, that is, don't put limit on the time, going from A <coughs> to B. Hmm? Compute the probability of going from one state to another state. And you get a number, OK? And now you want to compute the probability of going from A to this subset, much larger than B, containing B inside. In our case, C happens to be a subspace, but also a technical point, it doesn't really matter. So everyone knows, talking about Enrico's inequalities from yesterday, that this one, which way does it go? This one should be less or equal than this one. Is that right? That certainly happens, that is nothing but, but common sense, all right? Because you are enlarging the target space, the probability should go up. We don't prove that this is false, but we prove that sometimes it is false. We find very concrete examples that can really explain to anyone in a linear algebra class. Our Hilbert spaces are essentially C2, we don't need any more than that. What we found is that this is not necessarily true. I'm not saying that it's always false, okay? But there are cases where it's not true. So, if you're an experimental physicist, please talk to us, okay? We would like to find somebody that finds directly an experimental check on this, okay? Or maybe modify this in a certain way. And that's, that's the result in the paper. Thank you very much. I just got one on email today, and let me try to see if I can actually handle this. I'm not very good at this. This is from Andrea Nachmod. She was here earlier, but had to leave to catch her plane, so she wrote something that I'll read to you now. I first heard John Bourgain speak in 1987 at a special semester at MSRI in classical analysis organized by Pfefferman, Stein, and Weiss. His talk was on the geometry of Banach spaces. I was a beginning graduate student at Yale at the time, working already with Rafi Koifman, and I recall Cora Sadowski, Sadowski uh, who knew Bergen well, telling me, telling some of us to pay special attention to this guy because he was brilliant. If memory serves me, harmonic analysts were not yet taken by Jean, but Cora knew better, and she was right. I heard John speak a few times after that, but it was not until 1997 when I, I first was first a member at IAS, not as a postdoc, but still quite junior, that I talked mathematics with him. In echoing what Tom Spencer said last night in Giliola, and in Giliola's experience, Jean took an interest in my work at the time on bilinear singular multipliers which came at the heels of the lacy thiel proof of the boundedness of the bilinear Hilbert transform. He would come to my office to explain to me the connection to problems in ergodic theory that he had been working on and ask me insightful questions about the proof. After my IAS seminar talk, he stayed behind talking to me for over an hour and a half, explaining to me the connections to Gower's work and suggesting I find a comprehensive criterion for the boundedness 
a so-called T1 theorem for bilinear operators. He knew, or like Vitaly Milman said, he felt such a criterion should exist, and he was right. Giuliano Stafilani and I were back at IAS in 2003-2004, and during that time, he again proved to be extremely generous with his time and ideas. During this year, we got to know him a bit more as a person as well. When I threw a surprise birthday party for Giuliano at my IAS apartment, we invited him, not really expecting him to come. But lo and behold, he knocked on the door with a big smile and an even bigger bottle of champagne and stayed for a while chatting with everyone there. The last time I saw Jean was when Giuliola and I went to visit him at his hotel right before his surgery at the Mass General Hospital in Boston in 2015. He came to MIT looking for Giuliola, who was not there at the time. I was in Cambridge working with her and subsequently got in touch with him and went together to see him. We spent over an hour with him talking about mathematics and life. It was a difficult time for him and he certainly showed his vulnerability. But at the same time, the same gift, courage and strength that we've all seen in him as a mathematician shined through that day as well. All right, so the next uh, person who I uh, will invite up here is Alex Kontorovich, another long-time collaborator with John. So Jean had uh, an immeasurable effect on, on my career. Uh, he's, he was essentially my postdoctoral advisor here, then collaborator, and then friend. Um, we wrote a dozen papers together uh, in the last decade. Um, I first started working with him after uh, the fall of 2008. So I applied to the IS. There was a special year in analytic number theory. And in my application, I said I wanted to work on um, the affine sieve, and I wanted to use bilinear forms techniques, which had not been uh, injected into the affine sieve. And I verified this with, with Peter. So apparently, uh, Jean sort of read my application and, and uh, asked to speak with me. But of course, he didn't ask me. He told Peter, bring this guy. So um, at, you know, I would visit Peter peri periodically. And on my next visit, after Peter and I finished talking, he said, OK, and Jean wants to speak with you. So we went to tea. And I sort of I had some tea. And then Jean saw me and said, ah, you're here. Follow me. And just walked out to his office. So I, I didn't know what to do. I started following him. Uh, sort of like being called to the principal. Uh, and, I, you know, a lot of people have talked about what it was like for them to read their first Brigand paper. I never read a Brigand paper. I was given a Brigand lecture. I sort of, it was, I didn't ask. I wasn't ready for what was about to happen. So for the next three hours, he sort of lectured at me. I had no idea what he was saying, but I wrote down every single word, sort of scribbled as fast as I could in my notebook, um, spent the next three to four weeks trying to figure out what it was that uh, he was telling me, and eventually I figured out that he was telling me how to solve the problem that I had proposed to spend the next year working on. So I was sure I wasn't going to get uh, accepted, uh, that my application to the institute would be declined. Uh, but actually, Peter said, no, no, that means he wants to collaborate with you. So, um, so that was our first, uh, became our first two papers, actually, because a, so a key ingredient in what was needed there was some something some actually stubbornly technical argument from the theory of automorphic forms um, and the spectral theory thereof, which luckily for me was one of the very few things uh, that John wasn't a complete master at. So, uh, and so that became our first uh, two papers, the second one joint with Peter also. Um, and I sort of assumed that that would be it, but uh, as fate would have it, these ideas ended up being useful in, as Peter mentioned, the Zaremba problem, the Apollonian problem, and um, and later we had a, this Beyond Expansion uh, program. And uh, as Zev said, you know, once we sort of got into a, a groove, our, our working, um, so I didn't work with him daily. We would sort of make plans for when I could stay late. And we would meet sort of a after tea. We would go to his office from maybe 3.30 until um, it had to be just before 9 o'clock, maybe 8.55, because we're going to Blue Point Grill, which closes at 9.30. And when they see us coming at 9.05, you just see the staff sort of, their hearts are, they're not going to get out of here uh, early tonight. On the other hand, if they saw us coming at 9.15, then they got very happy because then they could tell us the kitchen's closed and we'd go to Tiger Noodles next door. Um, 
But so we would we would eat from 9:30 until whenever they would eventually sort of all the t- all the chairs are upside down on the tables. We'd go back to his office, work until 1:30 or 2 o'clock, whatever the last train out of the junction is. He would drive me to the junction, and I would um, arrive home maybe 3 o'clock. By the time I get in bed at 3:30 in the morning, there's an email from John with a fax that uh, you know a scan that. Uh, that resolves the main issues that we had spent the previous nine hours. I mean, you know, people talk about these scans, but for those nine hours, we were struggling. He did not know how to solve this thing. And we really, really worked as hard as we could, and we couldn't do it. And I have no idea what he did between 1.30 when he dropped me off on the train and 3.30 or 4 when he sent me that scan. He must have some kind of, I don't know what kind of animal sacrifice he does in his office at that hour, (laughs) that he has some... So May said that she couldn't find his Fields Medal when she cleaned out his office. And maybe there was also some kind of black box, some dark uh, magic there that... uh, And the resolution was never, here's how you do it, you dummy. It was always, this isn't what you should be doing. You're trying to attack a wall, but actually go two doors down and dig underneath, and and it's wide open. So that was really uh, an amazing learning experience for me. let me just finish with one last anecdote, which was uh, kind of early on in our collaboration. I came into his office at our regular meeting time, and he, he was at the board sort of really frustrated, working on something very hard um, that he uh, revealed was uh, a homework problem for Eric, for Eric's PDE course that uh, he couldn't solve, and he was sort of you know, really, really frustrated and embarrassed. And uh, so, he said, do you know anything about this PDE? I said, no, but as I sat down, I flipped over my laptop and put it into Google, and the first page was the Wikipedia article that explains there is no solution, but there is an asymptotic expansion that you can do with a silly little trick. So I told him that, and uh, of course, that was the homework problem, to do the asymptotic expansion, not to solve and unsolve. So he was sort of, you know, he thought this was absolutely brilliant. Uh, so Google is one tool, that, and I think he learned that tool very quickly, as, as all others. Um, on one of these regular dinners in 2014, uh, he looked me in the eyes and said, you know, the, the biopsy came back positive and the prognosis is, you know, the survival rate is zero. Yeah, f- five-year survival rate is zero. And um, I'll miss him very much. Thanks, Alex. How are we doing? I think we're doing fine. Uh, next, Asaf Naor, who's from Princeton University, who I'm not sure that, you, did you write a paper with John? No, never wrote a paper, but knows his work very well. Thank you. Um, we, we all have unique stories. Uh, my, my unique angle in this is that I came into the geometry of Banach spaces in 1998, 20 years after Bourguin came into the scene and, and left the area already. Um, and it was quite amazing because the first, I don't know, two months, anybody who I told them, whoever I told them, um, I'm going to do Banach spaces, immediately had an anecdote. And it was always about Bourguin. And I'm not talking about Banach space people. So Bourguin spent, I think, his formative years in the Hebrew University. And every single, I, I went over my head, in my head before this, I know 12 separate professors who made a point to start by telling me, beware of where you're going into, there is this, um, some amazing story about Bourguin. And then every other university in Israel, whenever, wherever I went, every, whenever I introduced myself, I'm going to do Banach Spaces, I'm working with Joram Lindeshaus, a story about Bourguin. And conferences in Belgium and... In, in, in England, people, every person I met when I introduced myself, a story about Bourguin. So, okay, so I had to, to prepare something, and I, and I don't have first, I'm gonna end with a f- story that my personal experience, but most of these stories are second, are, are hearsay, so I actually made some phone calls. Sadly, many of the people who told me these stories are not alive anymore, but I did make some phone calls. And I'm just gonna tell you two examples, I have many, many, many more, and I'll be happy to, to share. Um, so the first one, oh, I, sh- I should have, uh, one thing I forgot to tell you that I mentioned all these, so I mentioned mathematicians who were introducing themselves by telling me a story about Bourguin. Um, but I have three examples of spouses of mathematicians. 
that when they met me, they said, oh, you're going to do Banach spaces? Let me tell you a story about John. Um, <laughs> that was, OK, so w this is the lore. I mean, so m all of you or many of you who are experiencing his present, um, maybe this is, a, this is how it's going to be in 20 years when um, new people are going to come into the field. That, that's, this is really a legend at the level of l lore. Okay, so, so the first story is, is actually by the wife of Gidon Shechtman. And, I, and this is a story that I, I called her two days ago to verify. It, I know, we know the date she was in a second wife. It was March 1982. Morgan was a very regular visitor to the Hebrew University, was very influenced, and was a student of the illustrious, illustrious functional analysis school there, and there was a conference. And um, the Shechtmans had a baby three months before. They were exhausted, sleep deprived, but they wanted to invite the participants of the conference to their apartment. And, um, and she remembers that people were in the apartment, and then this 28-year-old comes in, says a few things, walks into the kitchen, and then a line forms outside the kitchen of all the people she invited holding, each one was holding a napkin. Okay, and, 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 and they all walk in, and they, and they go in, and then come out extremely satisfied with something written on the napkin. Okay, it's a 28-year-old. Um, and and she, she, she told me that she remembers this vividly. That was a, the kind of thing that you, you notice. But there's one thing that she remembers more vividly from Bourguin from that meeting, is that when he walked in and he saw the baby in the crib with three-month-old baby, his question to her was, does he already walk? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> OK, so, 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 um, so that was, I know the date, because I know the th when the, the baby was born, and this was when he was three months old. Um, um, the other story is another colleague of mine who was a first-year postdoc. Um, so, so by the way, we, we heard many people say that they were mentioned, described questions that Bourguin worked on a lot, maybe the questions he said he worked the hardest on. There are so many of them. Um, I, I can tell you that personally, I, I checked my emails, there are the two main questions that he claimed he worked the hardest on were not mentioned yet in this conference. And I actually think it's true. He, he really worked on all these questions which should be all-consuming for a normal mathematician extremely hard. And all of us did experience the truth, which is he worked on massively profound questions with a lot of effort. Some of them are solved, some are open. Um, the, the beef comment is in the emails, the most recent email to me, I just I looked at this morning was when he was still sick, there was some problem which is still open that we have been discussing. And he said that he worked extremely hard on it, but could never get to the bone of it. That was analogies that he always used, uh, food analogies. or. Um, so beef is not beef bones. That, that was this was always a. <laughs> um, um, so in any case, so a, a colleague of mine told me that as a postdoc, he finally was in the same room with Bourguin, and he knew that there is one of the two questions that I mentioned, a very question that Bourguin de dedicated a lot of effort to. Um, this colleague of mine um, told me that he decided to. He had an idea. In, in the end, this idea didn't work. This problem was open, but he came up to Bourguin and he said, you know, he's a young guy, he introduced himself and said, um, here, I have this idea how to attack the problem, and Bourguin listened, and his answer was, this is 1984, 1985, this idea is so good that, good that if I were you, he's telling it to this young postdoc, I would not be going around telling it to people like me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, OK, so I, I want to end uh, um, with, with a personal experience. So this was, I was a grad student, and there was a conference in Israel in a hotel. Um, and um, we were already several, several days in the hotel, and every day there was a, a breakfast. And it, the conference continued into the weekend. And those who know, the, the breakfasts in Israeli hotels are great. And on Saturday, because you're not supposed to cook on the weekend. They, they usually put out something called jachnun, which is um, um, a Yemenite food, which is a piece of dough which is soaked in oil and honey. Extremely delicious, but extremely heavy. And, you, and you, it, it, it's brown and long, like a sausage, and, and you dip it into some tomato sauce. So in any case, I'm standing in line in front of this pile of jachnun, and all of a sudden, somebody's stepping me in the back. It was Saturday morning. And I turn around, and here's Jean wearing a suit with a tie. 
which he was wearing shorts before. So I, so I asked him uh, what's going on, and he said, um, I can only have breakfast. I'm going after it's a car. He's coming to take me to the airport. So, and I asked him, so why are you wearing a suit? So he said, I always wear a suit when I fly because it increases my chances of being upgraded. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that probably was a... <laughs> But it's probably true, but I don't, I, um, maybe it was it. So, but in any case, so why did he tap me on the, on, on the shoulder? Um, he said, what is this brown thing? So I, so I explained to him, this is this, uh, this dough that was cooked in oil and honey for many, many hours overnight. And, and he took one, go through one, and I cut him, I show, show him how to dip it in the sauce and eat it, and he puts it in his mouth, and his eyes popped, and... Um, he got up, he didn't say anything, he got up and came back with a, I've never seen an, a plate full of this jachnun. And in front of my eyes, I'm, I'm a witness, consumed it. <laughs> now, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen anybody consume so many calories. I, 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 easily 20,000. I, I have a, my brother, my, my brother is a professional basketball player. I've seen amazing feats of eating. I've never seen, I've never seen this in any human being. Not, so it's not only mathematics, maybe this is related somehow to his attitude to mathematics. But he finished his jachnun, said, wow, this was amazing, now I have to get to the car. He got up, got into the cab, and went to the airport. And yeah, I never asked him what happened after. But, <laughs> but, but OK, so this is, I, uh, <laughs> um, so the jachnun was good. <laughs> and um, yeah, and he, um, I never wrote a paper with him. He, he everything that I do, is influenced by Borgen. It's, it's a continuation of Borgen, and um, and it's a huge loss. Thanks, Thanks Asaf. Next, Ainur Bulut. Are you here? Yeah. Who also wrote pa some papers with John? Hello, everyone. Um, when I arrived at the Institute as a member, I found a welcoming atmosphere with many colleagues happy to discuss mathematics. Jean Bourguin was one of those colleagues. As Enrico mentioned yesterday at the dinner, I was privileged to overcome the sense of intimidation to interact with Bourguin, and we collaborated on an exciting series of works in random dispersive PDs. When I think of him, I remember our countless hours of discussions late in the afternoons and evenings as we struggled with the mathematical issues at hand. The schedule was very intense. I would at times put my thoughts underneath his door as I left for dinner. We would either continue our discussions after we had both returned for the evening, or I would arrive at the office in the morning only to find a note at my door often with a path forward. We all know how great a mathematician Bourguin was, one of the greatest of our time. Perhaps more importantly, he was also an extremely generous and kind person. Despite his many accomplishments, he was quite humble and always treated me as an equal contributor in our interactions. He was always eager to share experiences from his career and willing to give advice. It was a source of great inspiration to be around his constant and unparalleled focus on pushing forward the age of mathematical progress. He will be remembered and missed by many of us here and around the world. Thank you. Thanks, Ainu. Uh, next, we have Wayman Wang. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Who is, a, as we know, is a collaborator of John. So, um, my first real meeting with Jean uh, was in the conference in Brazil in 2001, where I gave a talk on Anderson localization for time-dependent Schrodinger equations. And uh, so you have 
heard from Anderson localization from uh, both uh, uh, Tom's speech last night and also today's talk by Lana. So, and after the talk uh, in Brazil, uh, Jean asked me some questions. So, um, at the time, amongst the many things that he was doing, Jean was working on his uh, new theory of uh, KM type of solutions to nonlinear to nonlinear PDEs. So, if I may borrow uh, Lana's vocabulary, so it will be uh, non-KM theory of KM type of solutions, right? And uh, the point is, as it turns out, my talk uh, my talk is very much related to it by way of uh, Anderson localization. So as you uh, remember, recall, perhaps, recall from Lana's talk this uh, morning, you know, one of the main tools in Anderson localization is the foolish Spencer multi-scale analysis. And so in 2002 and 2003, I came to the Institute as a member to work with Jean, and we wrote three papers together on KM type of solutions to nonlinear Schrodinger equations which requires a considerable array of techniques, including Anderson localization, semi-algebraic geometry, and perhaps uh, all minimal set uh, eventually, Peter, and uh, harmonic analysis, etc. cetera. Uh, it was a period of great mathematics revelation and growth for me. Through the years, we kept in regular contact, and I continue to benefit from our discussions and his vision. My last long discussion with Jean was in Paris in July of 2014, uh, when he came to Institut Henri Poincaré for Brésil's 70th birthday. And uh, I accompanied him, accompanied him when he, uh, I accompanied him on his walk back, on one of his walks back to where he was staying, and while explaining to him uh, what the problem I was working on. And Jean won the bre breakthrough prize in, 2000, in December 2017, as you may have all, you may, you may all recall. I emailed to congratulate him. I was at Princeton, in Princeton at the time, and heard that he was around. So I went to Simone Hall and knocked on his door. There he was, Jean, opening the door with his brilliant, brilliant smile. A smile I shall always remember. Okay. That's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, so I think the last of the prepared talks, and I think we're doing well for time, is perhaps one of Jean's few genuine students, in other words, not a postdoc or visitor at the Institute or at IHS, Peter Vayu. Um, I have been asked many times uh, what it was like to be a student of Jean, and um, it was great, and I uh, want to tell you a bit about this. Uh, so, of course, I, I learned a lot from him, and um, even though I know just a very little slice of uh, what he did, um, it has an amazing impact on everything I do. Uh, he was very generous with his ideas, and uh, he was also very generous with his time, and um, it was, he always made himself available very quickly. Um, so actually, uh, I got up uh, today very early because I'm jet-lagged, and I thought about what I will say now, and I looked up my emails with him. and. Um, so about 10 years ago, I, I sent him an email with the, the first draft of uh, what later became somehow the core of my thesis. And uh, I apologized that I took uh, several months to 
uh, write this short argument up that uh, we discussed uh, earlier. And uh, then, um, so I checked, uh, so according to Gmail, it took him 17 minutes to reply, and he suggested, this was uh, in the early hours of a Tuesday, and he suggested to meet uh, Wednesday afternoon, uh, because that will uh, give him enough time to go over it. And indeed, he went over it, and, and uh, he actually, I was, I was quite surprised, he read, read it very thoroughly, he marked uh, all my typos, and, uh, and uh, gave very good comments, so, and, uh, and I was very grateful for this because I, seeing his papers, I, I, I thought that he probably don't do this with his own papers. Um, yes, and, and, and he was also, also very generous with his problems, uh, uh, sharing, sharing, uh, sharing problems, and uh, um, which as, as for a student, it's probably even more important than uh, everything else. Um, so a couple of years ago, there was a program in the Israeli IAS, uh, where I only went for two weeks, but it was a very nice stay. And there are two things that I, I remember uh, very much. One is that uh, we had the snowstorm of the century. Uh, and the other one is that was the last time I, I met uh, Jean in person. And, um, and he told me about a problem that I, I couldn't uh, solve, uh, which probably doesn't say much, but, uh, but I think he also thought about it seriously, and, uh, and that probably means more. So I, I want to share, with, uh, share this with you, and then, then I'm finished. Um, so it's very simple. So you take the square and um, you want uh, to find in this endpoint and uh, basically you want to minimize the maximum for 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 all lines such that uh, the number of points in L plus the disk round L plus uh, the ball of radius one over n. So, so what you want to do is uh, you look at uh, all cubes of uh, it's one over n, and uh, you you want it to happen that uh, that very few points will fall in any such cube. Uh, and uh, I can also tell you why he was interested in this problem. He wanted to find a spherical harmony. such that the L-infinity norm is small, uh, so it is bounded by constant times the L-2 norm. And uh, basically the idea was to consider a linear combination of uh, Gaussian beams, and if you do something similar on the sphere, then uh, I'm sure that he could have done in uh, one second. Maybe, maybe for others it would take a bit longer. Uh, okay. So anyhow, uh, uh, this is this is the last uh, last problem I, I heard from him, and uh, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I think. The degree of the harmonic is arbitrarily large. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, I can do it. <laughs> okay, so I think we've come to the point where I would like to invite anybody who is here who would like to say something. Uh, we'd love to hear any further thoughts or comments. Um, I think. One word. <laughs> <laughs> 
personally published 85 his work papers, certified in Gaffa, Jordan, and 50 in Gaffa. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> Gaffa is that much better for it. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no question that uh, um, taking. Uh, the interesting thing about John, if, if, I don't want to say too much myself, but um, is he had over 500 papers, and I don't think any paper was without a new idea or a solution of a problem. It wasn't a matter of, he did have one trick, is he would publish papers in contra and do, and then again. So that kind of added. Uh, Well, okay, anyway, all I'm trying to say is amongst these over 500 papers, which me meant a lot to him, as we all know, they are all outstanding papers. Of course, uh, some percentage of them are absolutely spectacular, some in your journal. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, he, he was... Amazing. I think uh, I'm very happy that we've spent the last two days reliving him a little bit. These stories have brought him back to life. The little bit of mathematics we heard gives us inspiration. Um, is there anybody? Yeah, yeah, you have. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Serious. This was uh, so. When Jean got sick, he was in. Uh, I'm not Vitaly. You are my. T I, I have to follow your five minutes, uh, so I didn't include it. But it's. Uh, uh, so he was in. First, my former students don't treat me as if. Well, last time, last time you, last time you, you had a cane and you said. <laughs> But uh, I think it shows a side of Jean, which uh, he was in the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, before having an operation. My parents live in Boston, and I brought my sister, uh, sorry, my daughter. And I, my daughter at that time was very intimidated by a boy in her class who she thought was very intelligent. He said he could do fractions when he was three. And I thought, okay, let's meet somebody really intelligent. And I thought it would be good for Jean to. And he was in a shape which was, um, he was not in great shape. So I told him the story that happened to my, my daughter and me a few weeks ago when we went to the opera and then we took a taxi and and the taxi driver said, oh, what a beautiful girl you have. And then uh, she said, I have nine boyfriends. To which the driver said, maybe you can have another boyfriend. Look, I have a car. I can drive you around. <laughs> and then my daughter said, I think I can, have, I can use another boyfriend, but he must have 100, but he must have a castle with 127 rooms. I was a little surprised that, uh, don't you think it's better to have a car in Manhattan? I said, Daddy, you're right. Uh, next boyfriend must have both a castle and a car. So I told this story to Jean. I thought it would amuse him. And he said, you know, actually, I have a friend who has a castle. It's not very expensive to get a castle. Expensive thing is to maintain a castle. <laughs> and then he said, it was in May, and he said, you should go and uh, watch whales. It's a whale watching season. And we went the following day. And my daughter, to this day, remembers that it was in Boston. We took a boat. And I think another remark I can make is that Jean loved ocean. Um, when I brought, so um, he left his computer laptop here and made sure asked me to bring, I was going to France and then I was visiting Peter and I brought his computer to Antwerp and met for dinners and, and he was telling me about what he ordered were a particular type of crawfish that you can only find in that area uh, at that time. 
And the last thing I want to say about the remarks were made about his papers having typos. So he didn't waste time. This is for young people. If you want to read his paper, you should read the published version. Because his notes would be free of mistakes. And when early types, inevitably, uh, some typos might come up. But he would not look at what was posted at the archive. He would only check the proofs. And there he would make corrections. So I would go to the published version, because that is the version where he corrected the Thanks, Alex. All right. Uh, so do I have any takers? No? All right. So I think, I hope this has been a successful two-day meeting, remembering Jean, his brilliance, his sparkle. And we all know his sparkle in his eyes, apparently also for food. I didn't quite realize his love for food, but that came out in many stories here. Yeah. Okay, it was Belgium. <laughs> and I think I have left uh, just to thank the many people who made this event possible, the director's office, and in particular Susan Olson, Sharon Hunt, Meredith Lausier, and from the School of Math, Nicole Maldano, Mal Maldon Maldonado, Christina Phillips, Anthony Pulido, Dario Mastrioni, who, and Sam Vin. Nunzi, who arranged the technical side of this. And most importantly, all of you who've come here to share and remember Jean with us and the speakers. I uh, bid you farewell and thanks for remembering Jean. <laughs>